The Things They Carried, Chapter 22, Part 2. Linda was nine then, as I was, but we were in love, and it was real. When I write about her now, three decades later, it's tempting to dismiss it as a crush, an infatuation of childhood. But I know for a fact that what we felt for each other was as deep and rich as love can ever get. It had all the shadings and complexities of mature adult love, and maybe more, because there were not yet words for it, and because it was not yet fixed to comparisons or chronologies, or the ways by which adults measure such things. I just loved her. She had poise and had great dignity. Her eyes, I remember, were deep brown like her hair, and she was slender and very quiet and fragile looking. Even then, at nine years old, I wanted to live inside her body. I wanted to melt into her bones. That kind of love. And so, in the spring of 1956, when we were in the fourth grade, I took her out on the first real date of my life. A double date, actually, with my mother and father. Though I can't remember the exact sequence, my mother had somehow arranged it with Linda's parents, and on that damp spring night, my dad did the driving, while Linda and I sat in the back seat and stared at opposite windows, both of us trying to pretend it was nothing special. For me, though, it was very special. Down inside, I had important things to tell her, big, profound things, but I couldn't make any words come out. I had trouble breathing. Now and then, I'd glance over at her, thinking how beautiful she was, her white skin and those dark brown eyes, and the way she smiled at the world, always, it seemed, as if her face had been designed that way. The smile never went away. That night, I remember, she wore a new red cap, which seemed to me very stylish and sophisticated, very unusual. It was a stocking cap, basically, except the tapered part of the top seemed extra long, almost too long, like a tail growing out the back of her head. It made me think of the caps that Santa's elves wear, the same shape and color, the same fuzzy white tassel at the tip. Sitting there in the back seat, I wanted to find some way to let her know how I felt. A compliment of some sort. But all I could manage was a stupid comment about the cap. Geez, I must have said, what a cap! Linda smiled at the window. She knew what I meant. But my mother turned and gave me a hard look. It surprised me. It was as if I'd brought up some terrible secret. For the rest of the ride, I kept my mouth shut. We parked in front of the Ben Franklin store and walked up Main Street towards the State Theater. My parents went first, side by side, and then Linda in her new red cap and then me tailing along at 10 or 20 steps behind. I was nine years old. I didn't yet have a gift for small talk. Now and then, my mother glanced back, making little motions with her hand to speed me up. At the ticket booth, I remember, Linda stood off to one side. I moved over to the concession area, studying the candy, and both of us were very careful to avoid the awkwardness of eye contact, which was how we knew about being in love. It was pure knowing. Neither of us, I suppose, would have thought to use that word love, but by the fact of not looking at each other and not talking, we understood with a clarity beyond language that we were sharing something huge and permanent. Behind me, in the theater, I heard cartoon music. Hey, step it up, I said. I almost had the courage to look at her. You want popcorn or what? The thing about a story is that you dream it as you tell it, hoping that others might then dream along with you. And in this way, memory and imagination and language combined to make spirits in the head. 
there is the illusion of aliveness. In Vietnam, for instance, Ted Lavender had a habit of popping four or five tranquilizers every morning. It was his way of coping, just dealing with the realities, and the drugs helped to ease him through the days. I remember how peaceful his eyes were. Even in bad situations, he had a soft, dreamy expression on his face, which was what he wanted, a kind of escape. How was the war today? Someone would ask. And Ted Lavender would give a little smile to the sky and say, Mellow. A nice, smooth war day. And then in April, he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan Ki. Kiao and I and a couple of others were ordered to prepare his body for the dust-off. I remember squatting down, not wanting to look, but then looking. Lavender's left cheekbone was gone. There was a swollen blackness around his eye. Quickly, trying not to feel anything, we went through the kid's pockets. I remember wishing I had gloves. It wasn't the blood that I hated. It was the deadness. We put his personal effects in a plastic bag and tied the bag to his arm. We stripped off the canteens and ammo, all the heavy stuff, and wrapped him up in his own poncho and carried him out to a dry paddy and laid him down. For a while, nobody said much. Then Mitchell Sanders laughed and looked over at the green plastic poncho. Hey, Lavender, he said. How's the war today? There was a short quiet. Mellow, somebody said. Well, that's good, Sanders murmured. That's real, real good. Stay cool now. Hey, no sweat. I'm mellow. Just ease them back then. Don't need no pills. We got this incredible chopper on call, this once-in-a-lifetime mind trip. Oh, yeah, mellow. Mitchell Sanders smiled. There it is, my man. This chopper's gonna take you up high and cool. Gonna relax you. Gonna alter your whole perspective on this sorry, sorry shit. We could almost see Ted Lavender's dreamy blue eyes. We could almost hear him. Roger that, somebody said. I'm ready to fly. There was the sound of the wind, the sound of birds in the quiet afternoon, which was the world we were in. That's what a story does. The bodies are animated. You can make the dead talk. They sometimes say things like, Roger that. Or they say, Timmy, stop crying. Which is what Linda said to me after she was dead.